This video will be especially fun because I have a chance now to interview my co-instructor, Dr. Terence Sainowski. Terry's pioneering research in neural networks and computational neuroscience have made him a living legend. Dr. Sainowski is an investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, where he directs the Computational Neurobiology Laboratory. Above and beyond all of that, Dr. Sarnowski is also in the elite group of only 10 living scientists to have been elected to all three of the national academies in engineering, science, and medicine. What I think is perhaps most impressive, however, is that Terry has also graduated more computational neuroscientists than any other scientist. In some sense, then, this makes Dr. Terence Sainowski a leading father figure for the modern field of neuroscience. The ultimate goal of Dr. Sainowski's research is to build linking principles from brain to behavior using computational models. Today, I'm going to ask Terry a few questions about how he learns and how he thinks about learning so that we might all get a better sense of how to improve our own learning. So what do you do to help yourself learn more easily when you're looking at something completely new? Well, I like to get into the thick of it. I don't get much out of just going and reading a lot of books. And when I was in graduate school, I made a transition from physics to biology. And the way I did it was to get into a biology lab and get involved in experiments. And I, I'm a firm believer in learning by doing and learning by osmosis from people who are experts. How do you keep yourself paying attention during something like a boring lecture? I found th that there isn't a simple way to keep yourself attending something that you're not interested in. But I have found a little trick to waylay the, the speaker, and that is by asking a question. And the interruption often gives rise to a in, in discussion that is a lot more interesting. And it actually uh, follows the general principle, which is that you learn a lot more by active engagement rather than passive listening. So what do you do to get into and take advantage of diffuse mode thinking? I find that when I'm jogging or out getting exercise, that it's a wonderful way to get the mind disengaged from the normal train of thought. And I find that it's very, very possible to, to, to sort of come up with new thoughts, new ideas. And it's almost as if your brain goes into a new mode. You're running along. Things are passing you by. And you start thinking about what's happening. For example, the things that, that your brain has been working on, your unconscious thoughts bubble to the surface. And, and often uh, new ideas that uh, are, are going to be then helpful to you later on. The only problem I have is remembering all those great ideas. Because when I get back and take a shower, then a lot of them have evaporated. And that's why I, I like to take a little notebook along with me so I can take notes and uh, remember what it is that uh, I was thinking about. So do you multitask? Or, or if you don't, how do you resist the urge to multitask when you want to multitask? Well, I wouldn't survive if I couldn't multitask. And most of my day is spent talking with students, listening to lectures, interacting with a lot of people who are passing through, visitors. There's just a lot of things that are bombarding you, email, texting. And, and you know, th these are very important things that you want to do. But if you can't juggle, then it's hard to get through the day. However, I, I enjoy the evenings when the hubbub of the day quiets down and I get a chance to go into a more reflective mode and that's when I actually get my best work done. Do you do, you, do, you do, do two things at the same time ever? ever? Well, you know, you can't actually do two things consciously at the same time because those will get mixed up. It, it is possible with a lot of training actually to do two things at once, but it's, it's, you're not doing it efficiently. 
for me, multitasking is, is being able to switch back and forth, context switching from one topic to another. And some people are better at that than others. In other words, uh, sometimes it takes a while to get into the swing of things. If you're in the middle of writing a paper, for example, it may take hours before you get to the point where you can actually be productive and you're actually able to get something accomplished. But if, if, if you can, you know, after getting uh, lay, you know, uh, uh, into the middle of something, uh, switching from that to another task is, is sometimes very difficult to do if, if you're if, if you're middle of something. But I can do that very easily. I can switch back and forth, and I seem to be able to go back to the original task and and, and uh, take up where I left off. So uh, so that's one way of of accomplishing a lot. And I get uh, I have uh, fortunately I have a lot of very good students and uh, helpers and enormously productive environment that I, I'm working in. So it's, it's been, it's, it's really a joy to be here. So do you, How do you apply so your knowledge of neuroscience to your own learning? Well, you know, I, I think there are many little ways that I have applied what I've actually learned in the lab. And let me give you just one example to make it concrete. One of my colleagues here at the Salk Institute, Rusty Gage, made a very important discovery. If you read the textbooks, it'll tell you that all the neurons that you have in your brain, you had at birth. And after birth, the wiring takes place, and learning and changes at the, the connections between the neurons. But they're, they're the same old neurons that you had when you were born. Some die, uh, so you know, there is a shrinkage of your, of your cortex. However, Rusty discovered that in an important part of your brain for learning and memory, the hippocampus, and which is located right in the middle here of this model brain, new neurons are being born even in your adulthood. And since this is very important for learning and memory, it is obviously something that is very, very useful to be able to have new neurons. Now here's what we discovered together. We discovered that if you have a animal, we use a, a rat as our model system, and if you give it an enriched environment in which the rat is able to move around and do things and interact with other rats, that, and then look in the hippocampus, you find that the, the, the strengths of the connections between the neurons is much stronger there. It, it can be made by a factor of two much stronger than in a rat that has been kept in a cage where there's impoverished environment. Now, and here's now the, the, the key, okay? So having a rich environment is, 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 even as an adult, is going to help you, right? Instead of locking yourself in a, a monk in the room, uh, you really want to be surrounded by uh, other people who are stimulating you and events that are happening that you can actively participate in. So, so that's important. But now here is something Rusty discovered, which I think is incredibly important that in the absence of an nourishing environment, exercise will also increase the number of new neurons that are being born and survive. And so I am very avid at running. I've already mentioned that I get lots of good ideas when I run, but I also know that my brain is helping me remember things because of the fact that I have new neurons being born and surviving in my hippocampus. So that's one of many examples that I can point to in which what we've learned about neuroscientists from neuroscience has really changed the way I think. And it's a pity if you look at the way our, our new educational reforms in, in schools, what did they cut out when they want to add a new se a se session on, for example, learning something, for example, how to pass a test, right? Tests are being given now to help assess how well a student is doing and how well a school is doing. Well, it's recess. And what happens during a recess? Exercise. It's running around. It's exactly what you need, what your brain needs. It needs that moment of pause, of, of, of using your muscles rather than your brain to be able to process that information and, to, and, and get the neurons working on it. So I think that this is, again, something that is, should be a policy that 
we need to have our children out there running around. Have there been any special techniques you've acquired over the years that help you focus, learn, or create more effectively? I find that being in a, a creative environment where other people are, are creative is, is, is a way of enhancing your own creativity. I think that although the image we have of the creative thinker as being isolated genius, it may be true of some people, it's not true of me. I really find that I have better ideas if I'm talking to somebody and trying to explain to them my ideas. Often that process can it boost that creative process and in fact I think that you know having other people around to bounce your ideas off of is really for me a very very important part of doing science. How about test taking? Any special advice there? Tests are like any other skill. You can learn them. Uh, you can learn to be a better test taker, and you have a lot of good ideas about that. Uh, I I've discovered that, um, uh, the, 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 what you need things to avoid, for example, don't get hung up if you can't answer a question, go on to the next, because uh, you can always come back. And in fact, often, the, I, the answer to the problem that was holding you back may actually pop into your brain later on in the test. This is how our brains work. It's, it's, the, things work along parallel tracks. How do you approach your creative work in science? How do you keep yourself creative in the face of the onslaught of more routine day-by-day -day tasks? I've been very fortunate because I have a great lab and my students and colleagues keep me young in terms of learning new things, looking at things with new perspectives. So I think that having youth around really is a, a great way to keep yourself youthful. If you had any advice for a young high school or college student about how to learn effectively, what would you say? That success isn't necessarily come by being smart. I know a lot of smart people who are not successful. But I know a lot of people who are very, very passionate and persistent. A lot of success in life is that passion and persistence of really staying the course, staying working on it and not letting go, not giving up. That's really, I think, the most important quality that I see in students that I work with who are successful. Terry, I cannot thank you enough for your great answers that I think people will find very helpful. Wonderful. Now, I want to just give a little intro here. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Francis Crick's brain. So I first met Francis 30 years ago, and this brain was sitting in his office. And Francis was a close colleague of, I moved here about 25 years ago and got to know Francis much, much better. And one day, we were chatting, and Francis pointed out this brain that had been sitting there for decades and said, Terry, do you know that I just recently realized that this brain is actually much bigger than a real brain? And in fact, you could not fit this brain in my skull if you actually look at the relative sizes. It's, it's, this is a teaching tool for medical students. You, know, you can take apart the different parts of the brain. But uh, isn't it interesting that Francis Crick didn't realize that until much, much later when he actually looked at it with new eyes. And so you know, this is something about learning with fresh new eyes. Isn't it extraordinary, even a, a Nobel Prize winning discoverer of DNA. Well, there are things to discover every day about <laughs> things around us, ordinary things that you just have to look at them with a different set of eyes, a different uh, perspective.